church help us grow together as disciples um so we first started coming to the church when the kids were in the daycare here and like many people in bentonville we um worked from here we didn't have family here and we were able to find a community of uh, young parents who were like us in the same season of life and we were able to grow together and be together um and learn lots of things like patience and gratitude and forgiveness um, together and like the early church um, we were able to break bread together be around the table together be outside 
um, the pandemic's made that hard. And yeah, I mean, community is uh, one of the things that's kind of discouraged <laughs> when you're trying to keep everyone healthy and safe. But uh, I think when you take that vision uh, from the early church of what it means to really connect uh, with each other, uh, it gives us something to really uh, look forward to uh, as far as maintaining and rebuilding a community and a vision for our future together. This is the day the Lord has, been, has made. Let us be glad and rejoice. Are y'all glad to be here on this morning? Yes, the Lord has been good to us. My name is Pastor Andrea, and I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those who are here and those who are joining us online, if you're first time with us, a special welcome to you. If you have joined us online, we'd like to know that you're here, so please follow the Connect card that is pinned in the comment section. And if you're first time with us, fill it out too, and you'll get a welcome gift out on this week, and we will be in touch with you. Over the next few weeks, we are in our sermon series, um, Gather Together and Come to the Table. As we think about over the next, this, over this, this um, new year, 2021 and 22, about who we are as a church, and we're identifying the core tenets of who we are and, and learning to recommit to those in new, new ways. And so we invite you as we gather, learn, and serve around the table here at FUMC that you and your family pray over about how you're going to give your resources, your time, and your gifts to the church as we continue to live out who we are as a spiritual heartbeat of downtown Bentonville for those who are far away from home and need a new place to call their home here at First UMC of downtown Bentonville. I'm going to invite Brenda to come up. I'm here for um, an announcement for us on this morning. You just saw me on video, and now you'll see me again. Um, good morning, church. My name is Brenda Allison, and I am the chair of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. You'll sometimes hear us referred to as the SPRC. And I am uh, here to announce that we have a new lead pastor that is being appointed to FUMC Downtown Bentonville starting July 1st. Our new lead pastor will be the Reverend Dr. Michelle Morris. Pastor Michelle has a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Arkansas, as well as two degrees from SMU. Um, she is currently serving as the associate pastor at First United Methodist Church of Conway. Um, she is an author as well. She actually uh, worked with our church earlier this year doing the uh, gospel discipleship study. Um, she's excited to be coming back to Northwest Arkansas, where her first job out of college was at Store One in Rogers. Um, obviously, whew, uh, we'd also like to thank Pastor JJ uh, for her service to us this year. Sorry, I'm going to get emotional. Um, she's been a blessing to our church, and we wish her and her family all the best in the future. And so we ask for your prayers for Pastor Michelle, for Pastor JJ, and for our church during this time of transition. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Let us pray. To our God who is faithful and knows the plans for each of us and God's church who God has called to be here in downtown Bentonville. We thank you, O oh Lord, for all that you've done for us. And despite whatever we're feeling right now, we still give you the glory because we know that you know what is best for us right now and in the future. Oh Lord, we lift up Pastor JJ and her family. And we ask that you cover them in a mighty way, oh Lord. We ask for your love and your care and your healing and your peace. Oh Lord, we know that transitions, we know that life gets hard, but you, oh Lord, in the midst of it all. So we, we give it all to you. We lift this family of the Whitney family, the, this family up to you, Lord. In these coming months, we, we wrap our arms around her. And we're thankful for where she has taken us and will continue to take us until her time is complete here. And Lord, we ask that you give Dr. Michelle Moores and her transition peace as she is transitioning and coming into our church to be our new lead pastor. 
We don't have it all figured out, but we know, Lord, that you do. And right now we lift up our congregation. Lord, we ask for your peace. Peace that drowns out our, all our fears and all our uncertainties. Strength to continue to fulfill our mission as a church. You have called us long before any pastor has been here to continue to love one another and our neighbors as you have called us despite who our pastors may be. So let's lean in now more than ever to be your church. And you, O oh Lord, we place our trust. Now, O oh Lord, then you fill us with your holy presence right now. And we focus our attention on why we came here in the first place, to worship you in spirit and truth. May we come with all our, our burdens when we lay it down right here before you, Lord, because we know that you're a healer. We know that you give peace. We know that you give hope. So may we leave here this morning with a new sense of purpose and a new sense of hope and love in you, O Lord. In these we ask your powerful Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I will sing, sing, sing to my God, my King, for all else fades away. I will love, love, love with this heart you made, for you've been good always. As you're able, would you stand and join with us this morning? Your 
Come and fill our hearts. Come and fill our lives with your presence, oh God, this morning. Speak to us here and through your word. And speak to us here this morning through Reverend J.J. Whitney. God, we give you thanks for her life and for her ministry here to us. And we pray all the blessings upon her as she and her family transition back to Conway. Move in and through us that we would know your grace in this place. Oh God, we ask these things in your son's most precious and holy, holy, holy name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I want to thank Brenda Allison and members of our Staff Parish Relations Committee in receiving news this week that I would be taking a leave of absence from ministry. Um, so I appreciate their leadership, our bishop, and our cabinet for allowing me to take that leave. Um, I'm grateful for your emails and your texts and your phone calls and words of encouragement and support as we made a very tough decision for ourselves, for our family. Um, do you know when you're on the airplane and they say if the oxygen levels should decrease, that the mask will come down, you got to put your own mask on first before you can help someone else put on their mask? Uh, that's what I feel like I'm doing. I feel like I'm putting on my own oxygen mask. I'm getting the breath of life that I need so that I can be there for my family and for others. So I appreciate your understanding of me making this decision for us um, very excited that Pastor Michelle has been appointed to you 
she will be a great gift and she will build on what we have done this year in a very difficult year in the life of our church. So I'm grateful that the cabinet had the wisdom to appoint Dr. Michelle Morris to the congregation. She'll be joining you on July 1st. I'll be here till June 30th. You know I will. Um, and so I look forward to the couple of months together um, and for this time of transition to make it the best possible transition for Pastor Michelle in leading you forward. Please be in prayer for us, for Michelle, for my family, for all of us, for our church family as we move into the future. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles. It's the second chapter, verses 42 through 47. I invite you to listen for the word of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, open unto us your holy word this morning as we focus on what it means that we are the church that we are connected by a great web of relationships to you, to your son, to your spirit, and to each other. Lead us now as we meditate on your holy word. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They call it new monasticism, or the emergence in the last few years of intentional Christian communities. Now, they're most often made up of young Christians who want to practice living in a way that they feel Jesus calls them to in the gospel. Places like The Simple Way in Philadelphia with Shane Claiborne. They want to combine a call to discipleship with a call to live with those on the margins of society while forming a community together. And so they live together. They share all in common. The community members work part-time jobs, and a portion of their income goes to the community to pay for their living expenses. Though their community life is not strictly regulated, they devote their spare time to, to prayer and to Bible study, to the activities of what it means that you live together, you share life together. They engage their time in local ministries like helping neighborhood children with homework after school or playing with them when they come home. When Philadelphia officials began passing anti-homelessness laws, made it illegal to give food to the homeless, made it illegal for homeless to sleep outdoors or to ask people for money, it was the Simple Way community that stayed with them in Love Park, sleeping with the homeless in the park, holding worship services, singing and praying together, and serving communion pizza style with the community. In other words, breaking the law. So when Shane Claiborne and others appeared in court, Shane wore a t-shirt saying Jesus was homeless. After hearing the case, the judge overturned these laws and she asked Shane for one of those t-shirts. Someone said to the community, oh, this is so beautiful. You must be saints. No, we're not saints, they said. We're broken people who live together because we know we can't make it on our own. These communities are asking themselves the question, how is God leading me into deeper life with other people? Intentional Christian communities are living out what they see in today's scripture lesson from the Acts of the Apostles. They want to live as the early church. 
We find in today's lesson from Luke, the gospel writer and the writer of the book of Acts, Luke gives us a glimpse into the life together for those first believers. Because we're in the days, we're in the weeks after the resurrection. And they began to see that following Jesus on the journey was more than just stating a belief in him. It was a commitment to a holistic way of living and thinking of of faith and practice and birth of what it means to live together as Christian people, to be the church. As we read in the scriptures, the church was built on faith and repentance and forgiveness From a gift of the Holy Spirit, it was built on the foundations of the teachings of the apostles and what they learned firsthand from Jesus. It grew in fellowship with other Christians around the table as they shared in the Lord's Supper, but they also broke bread in one another's homes. It grew because they cared for each other's needs. They shared their resources in common, and the church became a life centered in prayer. This life together is what Jesus promised in the Gospel of John 10.10. I came that you might have life abundant. Jesus promised a way of living, as I often say, with mirrors and casseroles. To be in relationship with people that will hold up a mirror to your life, the life that you've committed yourself to, and that it's the same group of people who's going to bring you a casserole when you lose a loved one, when you're struggling. This community isn't just a set of beliefs about how God could fix our sin. This is a promise of community to fulfill the deepest longings we have for life. In the time of the modern church, we're disjointed. We are disconnected. We are a lonely society. If you need proof, just look to Facebook. It contains the very serious to the very mundane. From sharing news about one of our loved ones dying to saying, I had pancakes for breakfast. (laughs) We want people to know what's going on with us. We yearn for community. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want people to connect with us. We want those likes. We want those hearts as we share what's going on in our lives. But true community means commitment. Creating a church is about being intentional and showing effort and making choices that make this a community that's a priority in your day-to-day living. Church demands accountability, but it also promises joy. It's made of people who are going to teach you and teach your kids It's a community that will walk with you in the ups and downs of life. The early church practices remind me that true friendship is a vital Christian practice. Now we find it especially laid out in John's Gospel. Jesus says it over and over. No one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Or he says, I do not call you servants any longer. I call you friends. Our relationship to be in relationship to serve our neighbors really depends first on how we can have true and abiding friendship in the church. These relationships that feed us and form us. True friendship is is where we learn about one another's struggles. It's where we share in each other's joys. Friendship is absolutely necessary for people intent and living more in line with being a follower of Jesus Christ. Friendship is about searching for God and helping each other understand where God is on the soul's journey. It's about being in dialogue about the mystery of God and the life of faith. It's about helping your friend discover God's will and intention for their life. Friendship also connects us to God because we remember that God exists in relationship. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So just like all of the ordinary practices that we engage in in the church when we we take bread and juice, when we sprinkle each other with water, when we wash feet, when we bless someone with oil, 
the ordinary practice of friendship should also create space for the holy to show up and to bring us into greater intimacy with God. As Dorothy Bass writes, churches are good places to encounter potential friends because where else in our culture can we go to encounter people of all ages and all backgrounds? How else can we get to know people across the many boundaries that divide us? Where else can we cultivate friendships with those who are older or younger or wealthier or poorer or less educated or better educated whose work is unlike ours, whose origins are unlike ours? Where else are we invited to regard one another in the light of God? And yet these friendships have to be nurtured. These practices must be intentional we have, we have an opportunity to meet the best parts of ourselves if we are willing to form and practice deep, abiding friendships across the boundaries that society has placed on us. The Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber is a Lutheran pastor who's far from typical. She looks more like the canvas for a tattoo artist. And she says it's a good day when someone mistakes her for a blessed dancer rather than a Lutheran pastor. Reverend Boltz Weber started the Church for Sinners and Saints in Denver, Colorado. And in her book, Accidental Saints, she tells the story of being on a Holy Land tour with other Lutheran pastors. So before she went on the trip, she talked with their leader, Bishop Bruce, and she said, Bishop, I'm worried about being on a tour bus with Midwesterners for two weeks. <laughs> she said she fell out of control at the thought of being stuck for two weeks with people who might want something from her, like to laugh at their jokes or to look at pictures of their grandkids. Nadia, he said, if you're trying to get me to say that no one on this trip will annoy you, I'm afraid you're putting me in a weird position and having to say a lie. But she went. Now, she didn't think her fear of driving up a mountain on a tour bus and taking hairpin turns would cause her to look down the mountain and it would give her so much anxiety. And so she was turning to those Midwesterners on the bus and she was asking them for some Valium or anything to help her cope. As Reverend Boltz Weber put it, it was like putting a real chink in my keeping distance, thank you very much, armor. She was looking out from the bus over the land of Jericho. She remembered the story in the Bible of Rahab and how only through Rahab's help were the spies of God able to succeed in their quest. Had that been humiliating for them, she wondered, receiving help from a prostitute? On one particular turn, the bus straddled both sides of a cliff. So the bus driver had them all get off before the bus fell off the mountain. And as she got off the bus, Nadia said, I, I couldn't catch my breath. And she sat down, she put her head between her knees. And Sharon, one of the trip participants, came up to her, put her arm around Nadia and said, you're okay, I am here. Sharon told the leaders, Nadia can't get back on that bus. You're going to have to find a way for her to get up to Jericho. Nadia remembered she was so strong and so grounded and everything I was not in that moment and I needed her more than I needed anything else. Nadia was able to get a taxi to drive her the normal way up on a less dangerous road. And the next morning, Nadia came down to breakfast, embarrassed, contrite, but with an open heart. When Sharon and Mark laid down their plates beside her, Nadia said, So, Sharon, you guys got any grandkids? <laughs> Perhaps the secret of true community in the church is that you understand that you actually need these folks as unlikely friends as they are. You need someone to bring you the sandwich tray when a loved one dies. You need someone to pat your back in church when your kid's screaming. You need someone to notice that you had a bad week to take you out to coffee. Make sure you're getting out of bed in the morning, putting one foot in front of the other. You need church. 
Sunday morning church life doesn't cut it. It's just scratching the surface of what church can be. Jesus promised us so much more if we are willing to make a commitment to a life together. We swallow our pride, we are humble, we show vulnerability because it means that you might find exactly what you need even from the most unlikely person. The beauty of church teaches us to rely on help from our church family and trust the wisdom of those who know a lot more than you do when you're apt to think that you can do it alone. Now, it's been a year of hunkering down in our homes. And if this is the table where we meet Christ, it's most certainly the table where we come together and grow in friendship with each other. We need our church friends who say, you're okay, I am here. Now is the time to think about what it means that we come together and we build friendship and we take care of each other and we share what we have with each other and we live as the church because we're actually all a broken down mess and we know that we can't do this life alone. Thanks be to God for the church. Amen. As the ushers come forward, I'm going to invite them to come forward. I remind you that we share a life together around the table here at First United Methodist Church of downtown Bentonville. I want to thank each and every one of you for your continued generosity that gives us an opportunity to support each other on our life's journey. The gifts you offer ensures we can be the church in the most sacred moments of our lives, when a baby is baptized in Christ's church, when a young person commits to be a disciple of Christ, when a couple makes a marriage covenant with each other, and when our loved ones are leaving this world. The church is here for these moments and the moments in between. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our God, you guide us as a living shepherd. In your presence, our spirits are renewed. In your wisdom, we discover peace. In fellowship together, we find ways to share your good news with each other. As we enjoy your blessings, help us to give from our abundance with glad and generous hearts. We dedicate these tithes and offering in the name of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for his walk. Amen. You can hold my hand when you need to lay. Be a mountain when you're feeling valley low. I can be a streetlight showing you the way home. If you can hold my hand when you need to let go, I want a house with a crowd. If it-